by the United States and Russia. And there's much else to be gleaned from this chart, uh, which is updated every June. Um, and each of the uh, icons on this chart stands for five warheads. Um, and it, I mean, one thing that is, I guess, most important to see that everybody here already knows is that Korea that we're talking about as such a nuclear threat, and which is a nuclear threat, um, has fewer than 60, a lot of uh, estimates still say fewer than 20. That doesn't mean we shouldn't worry about it. It just means that they're looking at a huge arsenal that sweeps from 3 o'clock on this map down to 7 o'clock <coughs> on this map, and does include missiles that are, are scheduled to be dismantled, but are not yet dismantled. And one need only think what we would believe if a, a country that we consider an opponent had weapons that they were claiming were scheduled for disma dis, um, dismantlement, but that were ready to be ready to be used. There's much more to say about this graph. The other thing I'll just say is that, um, as you've heard me say before, that keeping the physical architecture of nuclear weapons in place is assisted by a, keeping a mental architecture in place. And that mental architecture has certain key features. One of them that I'll come back to at the end that I'm more and more aware of and confused by is the fact that all of us speak to each other, but not to new people who are unaware of this. Um, if I had some way to take our speaker today everywhere I go, I, I wouldn't do that because he has the ability to speak that is, that is truly rare. Um, and I'll come back to that in, in a moment, the fact that we speak to each other and not to our neighbors and our colleagues um, uh, about this problem. But the other pieces of mental architecture are, you know, first the fact that because there's not readily available a great deal of information, um, we feel disempowered from speaking and we can be silenced because we can be barked at that we don't, you know, we're speaking over our head, we're not, we haven't been a, a missileman or we haven't been um, in authority. And we have to recognize that that is a piece of blackmail that has to be just put aside. If we have to speak with ignorance, we have to speak with ignorance. Obviously we should make ourselves as educated as we can. But that's made difficult by the fact that newspapers and so forth aren't regularly putting out a, a lot of information. The second um, piece that is keeping the mental architecture in place is this preposterous idea of deterrence. Um, we know that various people in the military, like General Lee Butler, have said that this is a, a kind of nightmare of platitudes that are illogical and uh, damaging and, and, in his view, stupid, and yet the nuclear priesthood kneels to them. And we have to you know, understand that and, and uh, read more about the, the folly of the language of deterrence. A third thing that's keeping the nuclear architecture in place is our belief that they cannot, uh, it cannot be undone. And this is crazy. We have a constitution that has a statement that, uh, that, that only Congress can authorize war. We have pieces of legislation that, can right now, that are pending right now that can be used to dismantle presidential first use. And if every nuclear state gave up first use, we would have the end of this nuclear competition. Um, but uh, and I'll come back to that one at the end. I think probably many of you know that it's HR 669. Um, last year it had 82 uh, co-sponsors, right now it only has 50 co-sponsors, 52 co-sponsors, because it, it had to be reinitiated with the start of the new year and everybody's gotten lazy. And I, uh, I think that in our own state, only um, Representatives Clark and McGovern are co-sponsors, so we have to go back to work on that. And the, the um, Adam Smith, Elizabeth Warren, um, no first use. Uh, piece of legislation has only eight co-sponsors in the House, so it's, there's a long way um, to go. But just on this point, that people believe this cannot be undone, um, there was a, a study done in Scotland that um, 
you may have heard me speak about before by John Ainsley, showing how long it would take to dismantle the British nuclear arsenal, which is, of course, a much smaller nuclear arsenal. It consists of only four Trident submarines. However, the whole thing could be done to two, in two to four years. One part of it would take hours, dismantling the nuclear triggers. Other parts would take days, bringing the um, tridents into port, et cetera, et cetera. But the whole thing would take three, two, two to four years. So it's a very finite thing. Compare, compare, this, compare this to solving the problem of global warming. Yes, we should all be working to try and roll back global warming, but it's very hard and amorphous. How do we do that? This is simple by comparison. We have the Constitution, the legal means. The physical means are simple. I don't want to over emphasize the simplicity, obviously, how to store um, the fuel and everything is extremely hard and extremely dangerous. But compared to the nightmare that um, we have set up, um, it's, it's very simple. Some time ago, in the year 2000, there was an article in Wired magazine that uh, talked about how uh, our robots might eventually carry out a revolution uh, <laughs> uh, against us, as, as we heard about AI today. And it was, um, it was by one of the leading kind of technocrats, it, it, it may have been Bill Joy, I'm just forgetting which author it is, and I apologize for that. And he went through this and he said, the prototype of robot revolution is already there, and the prototype is nuclear weapons, because we've come to believe that we can't eliminate them and they can for sure eliminate us. Um, so the, the, we have to undo this notion that we can't get rid of them, because we, we certainly um, can. Now, to come back to my first point about speaking to other people, I'm just so aware every day of how I abstain from speaking to my own colleagues. I, I make fragile gestures. I put this up where it can be seen. Um, you know, I, I, put, I, I put little labels on it. We don't, Etc. The other night I was at a book group and nuclear weapons were even mentioned in the book, so that was my occasion. And I did talk about it, and I could feel that everybody there felt that they had to patiently let me have my say. <laughs> and then, and, then uh, and, and, and I left feeling you know, bad that I hadn't, uh, hadn't enlightened anyone and had only, uh, you know, sort of possibly violated the hospitality of the evening, et cetera. So I hope sometime we can talk about who did we speak with this week or this month? How did we overcome this problem that people's eyes just glaze over? Um, what are the concrete steps to making ourselves uh, not just speak with each other, which is always tremendously rewarding, but to speaking with, with other people? So I'll stop there. Well, uh, I'm, I'm a physicist who has for many years been concerned about nuclear weapons, uh, partially because I'm a nuclear and particle physicist and my predecessors made the bomb. So I carry a kind of guilt with me, the original sin. Uh, and so I, I've tried to be informed uh, through the years about developments in the nuclear weapons issues. And uh, I, I listed several of them at the beginning. Uh, and by the way, uh, I appreciated what you said about talking to our colleagues, because I do the same thing. I put up posters. I occasionally say something, and I'm, I'm, I feel, you know, I'm out of place. I shouldn't be doing this. Uh, but I teach a course now and then where I talk about nuclear weapons. And uh, with Eric Bernstein at MIT, we spent some time uh, strategizing about how to get part of, uh, how to get physics departments throughout the country to include something about nuclear weapons, even in freshman physics where energy is a big thing. Mm -hmm. And the mention of nuclear energy comes up inevitably, yet nobody, not nobody, but most of us don't talk about nuclear weapons at that point. Or in passing, let's move on. Uh, so. I've been concerned about this for some time, 
and uh, there were people who were sympathetic to this cause. And I think there are a few universities in the country where this is happening, but it's a slow process. Uh, anyway, one, one issue that I think you've both mentioned about artificial intelligence, we've entered this age that we have to worry about artificial intelligence because of privacy issues, because of uh, the robotization of our economy. But there is also going on artificial intelligence being used for weaponry, uh, automated weaponry, autonomous weaponry, it's called. And, and there's been some alarm expressed in the industry. Uh, Google employees who are concerned about contracts that are from the Defense Department that are using their expertise uh, to do who knows what uh, nefarious things. So I'm worried about artificial intelligence. It's not getting a lot of attention when it comes to weaponry. But imagine, not only do we have the missiles that are launched from silos in the middle of the US uh, on command, imagine them being on their own command, which could very well happen with cruise missiles, drones, uh, it's very worrisome. And maybe we're at the point where we can say something about that to take advantage of the fact that there is an awareness in the uh, technology world that this is happening. So with that, I think uh, I'll move to the next person. Well, do you want to move to Guntram then? Yeah. Guntram uh, Miller. Uh, has been concerned about nuclear weapons. I like his introduction because it's, it's a lot of time that could command other people to talk in the, in the, in the group. Um, he's been concerned about nuclear weapons, especially since the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. Super scary. He's been active with 2020 Action uh, Mass and Massachusetts Peace Action for years. 2020 Action is a group that sends out a card every month uh, that's decided upon by the members. And we uh, uh, originally were talking only about nuclear weapons. We talk about climate change as well and environment as well now. So we have a number of different people in the group. but. Um, and Mass Peace Action, which he was the chair of the board for some years, during which time the world's nuclear arsenal went from 65,000 to 15,000. Good work, Doctor. More work. More work to be done. It looks like it's going the other way. I had a lot of help. <laughs> so, Gunter, please. Well, with that introduction. Well, you. <laughs> I wrote it, I know. Yeah, so um, the INF, Intermediate Range Forces uh, Treaty, um, I just want to give a tiny bit of background, and I'm going to use my best Churchill accent. <laughs> uh, from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adri Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended. Now, this was a speech he gave uh, in Westminster College in 1946, and of course, Shortly after the Second World War, it was being recognized that, uh, in fact, two opposing powers were building up. And um, in the early 80s, uh, Reagan became president, and then Gorbachev became president of the Soviets. Um, and uh, a realization came in that, um, you know, here we have all these short-range and intermediate-range nuclear weapons, both in Western Europe facing east, and eastern Europe, including Russia, facing west. Um, and, um, um, you know, if any nuclear war was going to be fought, that might be ground zero of the action, and uh, those countries weren't especially uh, uh, liking of that situation. Um, also, there was the additional thing that the uh, firing time between firing and uh, hit was very short. Now. Um, uh, we may have often heard of the uh, half hour that it takes for an ICBM to go from Russia to America, roughly half an hour. Um, 
But there the times are much shorter, 5, 10, 15 minutes, depending on where it was fired and where it was fired to. So um, that meant a lot less time was required for taking proper action to figure out, number one, is what we're seeing actually a firing or is it a, something else, you know, a reflection of the moon on the clouds as it was in one case. And I mean, the whole slew of things where people thought, oh, there, there was a firing, but in fact there wasn't. Um, so um, anyway, Gorbachev, we were lucky to have had Gorbachev there. Um, so uh, Reagan and Gorbachev agreed to get rid of this whole class of weapons, the uh, intermediate range, which was uh, weapons going from, um, uh, I think, about 300 miles to, I think, 3,300 or 3,500 miles. Um, they would get rid of all those weapons, the ground launch version of them, because they were the most destabilizing. Um, I think so, it was kilometers. Pardon me? I think it was kilometers. Uh, I think our kilometers was 500 to 550. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Anyway, it's, it's rough. Uh, <laughs> um, and some of the smaller ones were also taken out, not by treaty, but they just decided to take them out. Um, so that meant, uh, I mean, that's been credited with sort of easing access to the end of the Cold War, uh, because the, uh, all these triggers that could have triggered it were removed. Now, it didn't remove all the triggers, obviously. There still were the ICBMs and conventional forces and so on, but still, it was a huge improvement. Um, so now, um, well, Trump has now uh, uh, announced uh, that uh, uh, his intention to uh, leave the treaty, and if he takes no further action, then August 4th, that step will become effective. Uh, that means that uh, Russia can now go ahead and build as many of these things as it wants. And uh, that's so can America, so can China, so can anybody. That treaty no longer applies to anybody. And originally applied only to America and the Soviets. Uh, but um, um, Putin has suggested several times that we should have uh, new negotiations to, first of all, clarify what the INF says so we get clear on what it actually calls for. And secondly, bring China into it, as well as the other nuclear countries, India, Pakistan, and so on. But uh, Trump has not uh, agreed to that. He has now taken the step to withdraw from it. So that's the INF. Um, oh yeah, so um, Trump has said that he intends to build weapons now that were pr previously forbidden by this thing. And uh, Putin has said that he would, if he does that, that he would follow suit. Great. That's the makings of an arms race, right? Mm -hmm. um, now I want to talk briefly about the uh, New START Treaty, um, which will go until uh, uh, 2021 and uh, can be automatically renewed for another five years without any Senate approval, because the, the president has to do that. Um, Trump has said he would like to also quit that treaty. He hasn't taken formal action, but he's indicated that uh, that that's coming up, or at least that he would like to get rid of that treaty. Um, what does it do? Well, it reduced the number of deployed nuclear warheads of any sort, uh, air, sea launch, land launch, um, to reduce them from what used to be the limit of, I think it was 2550, to 1550 on each side. Uh, so that has taken effect, so now each side has uh, at or below 1,550 nuclear warheads, uh, long-range nuclear warheads. Um, so now, if that were, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, do you want to come in? Uh, yeah, but I don't want to disrupt too much. So. Okay. No, I just wanted to sneak in for five or ten minutes. Well, I just want to take this. For a second to announce, uh, to tell you about Sobrata. Sobrata doesn't have a special time, but I want to encourage Sobrata to enter into the conversation. Sobrata Gostroy is a uh, research affiliate of MIT's program in science, technology, and society. And he spent many years in the engineering uh, and defense industry before <coughs> joining, joining academia. He was on the professional staff of the U.S. Congress and later a senior defense analyst at the G GAO and an investigative arms, uh, 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 
con an investigative arm of Congress. He began a whistleblower. He became a whistleblower after unco uncovering fraud in the missile defense program. His research includes military industrial complex and nuclear weapons and nuclear disarmament. He is also the co-author of a book, South Asia at a Crossroads, um, in 1910. And I just, I just kind of want to tell you that, Sabrina, you, well, I want to ensure that you feel free to enter, to enter into the conversation. When, thank you, thank you. But, and excuse me. For a good time we got interrupted. Well, I basically have one more thing to say. Thank you. Um, uh, about the new START Treaty. So, like I said, uh, President Trump has indicated his uh, desire to get rid of that also. Um, and if that were to happen, then we would have uh, uh, basically no restraint on how many of these weapons that we can build. Now, you might say, oh, but there's the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. But that doesn't seem to be uh, de deterring, <laughs> not, not the five pledged nuclear states in any case. Uh, we have yet to start negotiating getting rid of them as we had uh, committed to in that treaty. Uh, so now, what I'd like to do is to hand out these things. Uh, as um, Sheila mentioned, I'm also a member of 2020 Action. We come up with an action, monthly action postcard. So we have two of these on the INF, printed front and back. Uh, so uh, if you'd like to hand them out. Thank you very much. Maybe I should let this happen first. Do you mind if I drop a political note into this? Oh, yes. please. Um, this is pretty firm from inside the Beltway. Donald Trump was perfectly willing to sit down with Vladimir Putin mm -hmm. and begin talks about multilateralizing and doing something about preventing an arms race, the nuclear arms race. The domestic political situation which captured Trump, that is to say the Mueller investigation, the Democrats bringing all the charges about Russian collusion in the 2016 election and so forth, stopped him. That's what domestic mm. politics will do to you sometimes. This would have been a positive move, in my view. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and yet we stopped it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe Was that reported in the in the in the press? Probably not. No. No. Yeah. But anybody who studied domestic politics in the United States for fifty years, like I have, it's true. Sure. Thank you. We, we did it from the perspective well, we went of to Helsinki, and then he was torn to pieces yes, when he came right. Yes, right. Yes. Well, you I don't dare sit down with Putin if you've got the kind of polling on that sit down that he had, mm -hmm. yes, largely created by the Democrats. Yes, yes. For political purposes. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I mean, it, this is what I say when I say this. the situation in Washington is poisonous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you hear yeah. even on liberal television, right. acting as though Trump's talking to someone in Russia with the treason. Yes. This yes. is a work yes. on that. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I want to just throw this in because I think it's very relevant to what you're just talking about, talking about Korea. But Mike Van Els Elziker is a neuroscientist at Mass General Hospital, Harvard, Harvard Medical School. And uh, at, um, in, he's in, works on stress disorder and chronic fatigue syndrome. He is interested in, he's more than interested, he's deeply involved in understanding the ongoing reconciliation of the Korean Peninsula. And I, Hi everybody. Um, so I was going to talk a little bit about Korea, and I think it's got an analogy to the Putin situation, yeah. where um, Trump's uh, any talks with Kim Jong Un is used as a bludgeon against Trump at this point. Um, uh, and Matt Taibbi talked about this phenomenon um, when he said the whole point of not wanting Trump anywhere near a military engagement is that his judgment is terrible. Therefore, I'm glad when three ganglia he has left in his head randomly decide on a troop withdrawal. So in other <laughs> words, when he does something for peace, when he does something for negotiation or you know, pulling troops out of Syria despite perhaps escalating the drone war, we should support that, and liberals should support that, right, in general. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about the difference between um, the way we view Korea here and the way that it's viewed in Korea itself. So on December 31st, 2017, over to the 1st of 2018, I think a lot of people know that um, Kim Jong-un, 
gave an important speech, his New Year's speech, right? And the way that it was reported here, they focused in on one little thing, which is almost like a throwaway line, if, if you actually um, read what he said. The way it was reported here, um, the USA Today, for example, the headline was, Kim Jong-un's New Year's message, we have weapons that can strike the US. And then Fortune magazine said, Kim Jong-un threatens the US in New Year's Day speech. Fox News said, Kim Jong-un claims he has a nuclear button on his desk. So, of course, Trump reads the domestic press. He probably doesn't, or watches domestic TV at least, um, doesn't read uh, foreign press. So he responded by saying, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un just stated that the nuclear button on his desk is at all times. Will someone from this depleted and food-starved regime please inform him that I too have a nuclear button, but it is much bigger and more powerful than his, and my button works. So that was how we started 2018. Now, listen to the headline of the Hankore newspaper in Korea. This is the headline that was talking about the exact same speech. Quote, Kim Jong-un's surprising New Year's address could open the door to peace. So how did, what's the distinction there? What, what did they focus on instead? So. Before the New Year's speech, um, first of all, understand that Moon is there in South Korea, largely because of a peaceful resolution in, re revolution in South Korea. They had what's called the Candlelight Revolution, where for weeks and weeks, people were literally just occupying Seoul and other cities to overthrow what was essentially a corrupt right wing related to former sort of fascist dictators um, there. And they overthrew this former president, who's now in prison, by the way, um, and Moon was put in a new election, largely uh, to reconcile with the North. Some of it was domestic, but largely to reconcile with the North. Polling in South Korea is reasonably good for wanting to de-escalate, especially among young people. And he gave a little bit of a fig leaf a couple weeks before New Year's, where he said, you know, maybe we should do something in the Olympics. And Kim Jong-un, in his speech, responded by saying, yeah, that sounds kind of good. And South Korea focused on that and not the fact that he claimed to have nuclear weapons that could reach the U.S., by which I think he means probably Guam, who knows. Um, but part of the reason for that is that the South Koreans know their own history, and they know that the split in North and South Korea was sort of an unnatural thing, a, a relic of the Cold War. Um, you know, I think we all recognize that North Korea is a state that we don't want to emulate, and. You know, if we can, if anybody can point out how they're worse than our good friend Saudi Arabia, I'd be interested to hear about that. But um, <laughs> at the very least, um, South and North Korea, um, you know, they're, they're split, including families, by the way, um, many of which are now over 75 years of age. Um, they're split from the day after the Nagasaki bombing. Two officials from the United States took a map down and drew a line across the 38th parallel. And that's why there's a North and South Korea. A lot of people don't know that. No Koreans were consulted. That was sort of presented to Stalin, and he sort of said, OK. But it wasn't the case that this was a North-South Korea split. It was really the US acting. Um, the US actually ran South Korea. The, the army was the government in South Korea from 1945 to 1948. Again, a lot of people don't know that. So um, reconciling North and South is a priority for the, for the South Koreans. Um, and one of the things that has happened here domestically is that the Democrats recognize that with the amount of demonization that has happened against North Korea, again, it's not, this, it's, it's not a state we want to emulate, but it is a cartoon here in the United States. You can say any crazy thing you want about North Korea. Everyone there has to get a haircut like Kim Jong-un. Uh, he strapped his sister to an anti-war, or excuse me, an anti-aircraft um, uh, gun and, and executed her. You can, and then when it comes out, oh no, she's still alive. That doesn't make the press. Um, so you can say sort of anything you want, and the Democrats have recognized that this is a good chance to attack Trump from the right, to counter what they perceive, probably correctly, as um, them being perceived as sort of soft and weak and that sort of thing, that sort of stereotype as Republicans as being the, the, the better military um, party. The so, Hawks, anyway. The Hawks, exactly. So, for example, um, Chuck Schumer and yeah. six other top Democrats um, warned Trump, quote, any deal that explicitly or implicitly gives North Korea sanctions relief for anything other than the verifiable per performance of its obligations to dismantle its nuclear missile arsenal is a bad deal. So they're mm -hmm. sort of attacking him from the right. And, and understand that the sanctions now uh, you know, they can't import shovels. Uh, there's about five million North Koreans facing famine. They have an outbreak of treatment-resistant tuberculosis 
in North Korea that we're no longer allowed to help with. There's been a little bit of relief over the last couple of weeks in, this, in the humanitarian angle, but this, these are problems that are facing humans, not just um, the Koreans. Um, so the, the Democrats have taken this tack of attacking Trump from the right. And I don't know if this is his um, performing that he's this deal maker or if it actually has again worked, um, but this latest collapse in Vietnam, um, apparently what happened was that he demanded, or perhaps Bolton coming in last minute, demanded a full denuclearization for any relief at all. Um, and what North Korea had asked for was a lifting of the sanctions that were in place since 2016. These are recent sanctions. This is not even a long-term regime. A recent, um, the, the, the recent sanctions being lifted um, as a good faith measure in, um, in exchange for dismantling the Yongbyon um, nuclear complex. That was rejected by Trump at this most recent one, and he sort of went for it all and was rejected. And, and of course, it's presented here as those crazy North Koreans, we can't trust them, um, they're all just brainwashed and that sort of thing. But you know, again, remember that the Korean people remember their own history. The, North, the Korean War was a uniquely brutal war um, where, you know, in the entire um, Pacific theater, let me get the numbers here, um, in the entire Pacific theater, 503 tons of bombs were dropped, um, and in the Korean War itself, 635,000 tons of bombs were dropped, and that includes over 30,000 tons of napalm dropped, uh, so much napalm that Winston Churchill complained. Um, he said, I do not like this napalm bombing at all. A fearful lot of people must be burned, not by ordinary fire, but by the contents of the bomb. We should make a great mistake to commit ourselves to approval of a very cruel form of warfare affecting the civilian populations. Napalm in the war, meaning World War II, was devised by and used by fighting men in against tanks and against heavily defended structures. No one ever thought of splashing it about all over the civilian population. I will take no responsibility for it. It is one thing to use napalm in close battle or from the air in immediate aid of ground troops. It is quite another to torture great masses of people with it. So this is a war that killed about 20% of Koreans, about 4 million people. These are official Air Force numbers. This is not some, um, you know, sort of crazy, um, you know, um, propaganda. These are, this is from the official Air Force um, history, including, you know, hawks like Curtis LeMay giving quotes. So Yong Suk Lee, who's the Deputy Assistant Director of the CIA's Korea mission, points out that Korea, North Korea's nuclear weapons are a deterrent, which of course is obvious. Uh, he says, there's a clarity of purpose in what Kim Jong-un has done. The last person who wants conflict on the Korean peninsula is Kim Jong-un. We have a tendency in this country to underestimate the conservatism that runs in these authoritarian regimes. In other words, Kim wants to die on a bed in power. Um, and he's going to, of course, prioritize himself. Um, but if it if it means holding on to nuclear weapons, which of course is, uh, you know, a way that he can preserve himself, he's going to do that. Um, and just as a, another sort of example, um, in the uh, so in on March of twenty March twenty second two thousand three, in the middle of the shock and awe campaign. Um, the U.S. performed joint military exercises on the North Korean border, again showing that we could have a multi-front war. So we're constantly sending messages to North Korea that we're going to overthrow and, and, and uh, attack. They have these weapons as a deterrent, and what they want is security guarantees. So what, that's part of why they want an official end to the Korean War, which was never ended officially, um, the longest running official war in the U.S. So what we can do, I guess, here is to try and push our reps um, to un understand that uh, you know Trump may be a cracked vessel, um, but it, this is sort of the best chance we have. Um, and you know a lot of Korean activists are asking us to, to put forth the, the theme of peace treaty by 2020, and that's South Korean activists because they recognize that there's a unique opportunity, probably because President Moon is so savvy that he has stoked Trump's ego um, and given him credit even more than he deserves. Um, but that's I think what we can do to try and. Push peace in Korea. Just Add a couple of points. I, I, Korea is a country I've spent more time in than any other country in the world, other than my own. I've been on the peninsula since 1972, almost every year, at various levels. So the last level I was there was exercising with Secretary Perry, for example, mm -hmm. former Secretary mm -hmm. of Perry, in something called Pongwa 2004 with the Korean equivalents. 
I was stunned last week and I saw the polls from South Korea. 66% of the South Korean population said the number one threat to their future is the United States of America. 66%. I've not seen anything like that from Korea. Pakistan, yes. Egypt, yes. 80% of the population thinks we are. In fact, 3.5 billion people in the world think we're the number one threat to their future. And nuclear weapons plays a big role in that. But other things like our actions in the Middle East do too. Second point I would make is that Moon Jae-in's political mm -hmm. future mm -hmm. rests on this. That's right. Mm -hmm. yes. He is out on a plank which we marched mm -hmm. him out on. Mm -hmm. And he's over the deep blue sea and we're sawing mm -hmm. at the back end mm -hmm. of that plank. Okay. And it isn't going to go anywhere but far worse if he sinks. Mm -hmm. And I agree with everything you said to include the, the, the comments about uh, what we've done to make his situation even tougher and to make the negotiations even tougher. I would add that what Kim Jong-un offered, and this is from Steve Began's briefing at the State Department and elsewhere, senior government official, but I knew it was Steve, they made a mistake on their side, I think, with regard to not differentiating what they were going to do at Yongbyon, which I'm mm -hmm. well familiar with because I monitored it from the State Department in 2002, 3, and 4, and what they need to do at Yongbyon. It was only a partial, and it was the stuff that's already mostly been stood down. So he got bad advice from his advisors, too, I think. The good thing is, I think both sides understand these problems, and so there's another meeting, I, I think, out there. And again, we need to work on as much as we can the political pressures that foul these meetings before they even get going, which you have enumerated quite well. Can I ask you, uh, in regarding um, Steve um, Youngin, um, mm -hmm. he, in Stanford, a couple weeks before this summit, he gave a talk where it was really great. Yeah. He seemed to really get it. He understood that it was a process. It wasn't going to be home run Bolton. right away, right? John Is that Bolton. what happened? Because he took a switch. That, John Bolton. That, that, that press conference Bolton. that you're talking about now, he sounded a lot different. John Bolton abominates mm -hmm. arms control. Mm -hmm. He thinks negotiations with people like Kim Jong-un uh, are just nonsense, that they mm -hmm. wind up sacrificing more American interests than they do gaining. Yeah. And he's again it. I mean, he is massively again it. So, He's got to be careful with Trump. I mean, he's the third, maybe going on fourth, <laughs> national security advisor, but uh, it's John. Yeah. Uh, Christine, Christine Hahn wrote about how she was surprised because she was there with Lulu Bush and TMZ. And she wrote about being surprised at the seating arrangement. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when she saw that, when she, when she saw that, 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 that Bolton was in front of Biggin, uh, she knew something was off. Yeah, I was and with Christine on Joy Reid's show this last year. Yeah, so we had a chance to talk about it. <laughs> so, you know, it was Bolton taking over. Uh, thank you, Sheila. Uh, just, yeah, on, on this issue, uh, so I was uh, there um, uh, December 7th, 8th, and 9th. There was a conference uh, in Jeju Island. Uh, first, it was a close conference of the UN uh, ROK Conference on Nuclear uh, Proliferation. And there we had the State Department person, former undersecretary, who basically said it's not going to work, meaning there won't be peace with North Korea. So I, I really took him on on that, called him out that that's just a totally self-fulfilling prophecy. So one positive thing that on the US national security state, you have in unison opposition to a rapprochement with, with, with North Korea. That's absolutely clear, led by the Democrats. And, and that we have to call out. These Democrats have to be called out by the peace movement is what they're doing in sabotaging anything like this. That Trump may be inconsistent, he could be all over the place, but when he's doing this thing, he needs our support. And the peace movement needs to speak up. But the positive thing in, in Korea, and I'm not an expert in Korea, I was there, but I did have two very interesting meetings. One was with the former foreign minister of, of ROK, and another with a very, very conservative analyst uh, who worked for the uh, former president, who is now in jail. And uh, so he was the chief of staff that worked out of the Blue House. And this uh, uh, other gentleman is now a professor, but he was a foreign minister. Both of them, so they don't represent the so-called peace community or anything, but it is amazing. I had a two-hour meeting with them, and both of them said that the 
what we have achieved now in Korea in terms of a political climate and the support for a peace a treaty with uh, uh, North Korea. And Kim Jong-un was supposed to come. He was going to make a surprise visit when I was there. So there was a lot of excitement in Seoul that Kim Jong-un was going to come make a visit because his mother is from Jeju Island mm -hmm. also. So it's, 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 it's very, very interesting. But this particular aspect where that Moon is not so vulnerable now, I mean, he's out on a plant, mm -hmm. but the political climate has changed in Korea for the better. So I think that, that that's a big positive development. Yeah, it is. For, the, 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 diff, the danger is that we'll pull the rug out from under. Yeah. And yes, we, and yes. we won't get right. a deal, right. and he'll be stuck either negotiating yeah. unilaterally, which I think is dangerous, and Japan will not like it all, yeah. or he'll just collapse in the whole the yeah. sunshine yeah. policy of old. You know, we've seen this before. Yeah, his yeah. poll yeah. numbers have gone down from 80 percent yeah. to 50 percent. We pulled the rug out before. from under Kim Dae Jung. We did. We my administration pulled the rug right out from under. When Jim Kelly went to Pyongyang and talked to Kim uh, Lee Gun, Yi Gun, and uh, Kang Sok Ju, and they admitted they had a uranium enrichment program on the side. I would have had the same thing where I've been because we were cheating on the agreed framework. Mm -hmm. We weren't delivering the heavy fuel oil, mm -hmm. and we were way yeah. behind with that's the light water right. reactors. Right. We hadn't appropriated mm -hmm. even a penny mm -hmm. towards the second mm -hmm. one. And so we were in the game. We were doing our bad part in the deal too. Absolutely. But when Jim confronted those two negotiators, who were the key people, they essentially said, "We have a secret program," and Jim had to come home because Cheney had told him, "If they admit to the program, you're through. You're through. You're not negotiating anymore." So we shut down negotiations mm -hmm. completely with that October 2002 mm -hmm. visit, and then we got the six-party talks and. The, you know, lingering, 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 nothing really happening. Um, but I will point out to everyone here that the policy of strategic patience prevented war on that peninsula for well over half a century. And, you know, this is the first break in that. And it's fine if it turns out positive, but it isn't if it turns out to be bad. And, and we are, you know, the Democrats in particular, I hate to be harping on the Democrats, but their leadership taking advantage of Trump's vulnerabilities in these areas is making it difficult, if not impossible. And, and the, the, the yes. oh, well, the, my sense about the headlines, and I didn't read much into the details, but mm -hmm. the headlines with after the, the meeting in Hanoi um, was, um, well, of course, the, the, the images of this tin pot dictator from North Korea on the, with the red carpet and the dressed up train and that sort of like, you know, no, no need to think about it any more carefully. But the, but the main thing in the New York Times, the impression seemed to be Trump has failed and that's a good thing. Yeah. It was kind of like, uh, uh, that yeah. seemed to be the storyline was Trump has failed, yeah. That's if you contemplated him giving away the, the whole card. Well, and that's the way a lot of them were looking at it. That the uh -huh. only way you're going to succeed minimally you're going to give away the fact that they're late in nuclear power and you bless them. And that's going to cause Japan to go fully nuclear. Yeah. Because Abe is just salivating at the prospect of North Korea being blessed by the United States as a nuclear power and him being able to use that as an excuse to nuclearize Japan. And he would prefer that not to happen. He'd prefer to, be, to make the decision to do that later in life, as it were. But if it happens the way he's contemplating it on the war side, that is, we bless it. And that's what Japan thought. That's what Abe thought. Why was he being such a sycophant? He was literally licking Donald Trump's boots. That's not typical for a Japanese prime minister. So when this happened, Abe breathed a sigh of relief, I think, because he realized he didn't have to make the decision right now, which might cost him his political career. But that's the problem in that dynamic out there, is Beijing, Tokyo, and Seoul are all tied in, and we're the arbiter. And when, when we do the arbitration badly, it's really dangerous. Yeah, just a couple things here. I want just to say that I'm doing a conference, and I'll pass out some leaflets about it, which is a big international conference in, in, in New York. But among the people who are coming is Lee Tae Ho, uh, who's the, been the head of really the, the biggest and most powerful civil society group in South Korea. And he's one of the leaders of the candlelight uh, revolution. So I'm looking and itinerating him. Uh, and so, for those of you who are working on Korea, let's look at that. And also, just get him in to see the Democratic leadership. Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> the other, the other, <laughs> we're hoping to get, right. you know, maybe to, I, 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 I've been talking to Kevin Martin in Washington, 
in terms of trying to arrange some time for him there, but I, I need some more contacts in Washington, so maybe we can correspond about that. Yeah. The other is we're also bringing um, for the May conference two kind of leading figures in uh, Russian civil society who are critical not only of the United States, but of the Putin government, uh, both of whom have either been in prison quite a bit uh, or facing prison. Uh, brilliant, brilliant people. Uh, we'll be bringing them up to Boston, and I need input in terms of how best to itinerate them, and would love to have your, your input. And also just to say, you know, we've given very little thought today to what's going on in India, Pakistan, although your, your, your talk uh, mentioned it. Uh, Aishin Ben Eich, who's been one of the leaders of, uh, he's, he's a journalist, uh, one of the figures in the in the World Social Forum. Kind of sort of Damocles over all our necks. Um, you know, I read um, Daniel Ellsberg's book about six months ago, and right after I read it, I was like, for weeks afterwards, just like thinking about all the crazy shit he talks about in there, <laughs> and uh, like how terrible the situation is with the nuclear weapons and self-delegation and uh, potential for accidents. You know, there's a million ways that it could go down. And um, I, uh, I kind of tried to talk about it with a few people, and I ran into some sex, some success, but also some difficulties because I think if you say kind of like. It doesn't sound real, actually, to people. Like, if you say, like, there's actually this system out there, and there's one in Russia, and there's one here, that will literally destroy everyone if it functions as it was designed to function. You know, that sounds crazy, right? Um, uh, so it's difficult. And I think it relates to, um, like, we're talking about the stuff with uh, all these negotiations with Kim Jong-un, and the situation in DPRK. Um, the media here in this country is so fundamentally dishonest about the situation in the world, even basic aspects of it. I have never seen report any major uh, U.S. media house the basic fact that uh, for Kim Jong Un it doesn't make sense to give up his nukes. Like mm -hmm. that's a very basic fact that you need to have to understand the situation. It's clear if you analyze it, but the New York Times never says that. Ever. Perry actually has an op-ed in the Washington Post to that effect. Oh really? Oh, but, oh, but I missed that one. <laughs> you're right. It, it just fell on deaf ears mm -hmm. in the National Security League. Yeah. And, um, and for people more broadly, too, you know, they just see uh, these crazy caricatures and, and Trump Russiagate stuff, and that's what people are thinking about. Um, so I think it's very difficult uh, to clarify things to people. But I also think, uh, I agree with your point, that it's the people's movement, actually, because the nuclear weapons, this whole thing, it's not in the interest of 99% of the world. Um, and uh, there's a basis, actually, to clarify that to people and have people come together. Just last week at MIT, um, we had, I think, for the peace movement right now in the U.S., actually, a very large demonstration against Henry Kissinger's presence at this new um, College of Computing, which is this AI college that kind of MIT is putting forward uh, to meet the strategic need for the U.S. military to probably eventually automate the nukes and everything like that. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it's, it's a big thing, and MIT is very wrapped up in this. It was very inspiring to see how many students came out and uh, spoke very clearly about these issues and were really interested in getting involved. Um, so for me, I think that's one way forward that is really promising that young people today and the economic situation in this country is very difficult. Uh, student debt is ballooning and insane and uh, people want to actually talk about what's going on on a basic level, the relation between the economic situation, military industrial complex and the wars abroad and the kind of constant militarism. Um, so. Anyway, those are a few rather unconnected thoughts, but I'm very hopeful about the, the way forward. Well, I actually, just a second. It's so clear from Washington's point of view. I, I watch these guys vote based on the money that's done yeah, yeah, into their PAC, yeah, yeah. not on what their constituents say. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, let me follow up on that by moving the subject a bit to ABM, mm -hmm. because you were there at the time when the ABM treaty was abrogated, and uh, the beginning of, of W's administration. And Motivation for that was the military industrial complex, well, wanting to build ballistic mm -hmm. missile defense. They right. have now milked the United States government for a technology that is not even proven <laughs> of over $150 billion. <laughs> that is not, yeah. $300 billion now, if you look at the spending from 83, yeah. Because just yeah. when I was there, mm -hmm. we were funding at the level of uh, Clinton years was like five billion. Mm -hmm. This is just keep alive kind of mode. <laughs> that you keep alive the technology and the base, whatever. And then it became ten billion, starting Bush and Obama didn't do anything. Yeah. 
billion. It just continues just at continue. 10 billion. Yeah. So in 18 years at 10 billion is 180 billion right there in this century. And then uh, the one before from 83, Reagan, yeah. uh, 200 billion. So it's still 300 billion. Pretty there's soon we'll be talking we about real money. No yeah. <laughs> yes. to believe it will work. Not really mm -hmm. credible evidence. Yeah, well, every, every test yeah. has, has been, been Jerry either 50% yeah. yeah. fail yeah. or it's completely set up. You put a little device so on the hit warhead that says, come get me, come get me, come get me. Right. Come. <laughs> on my side of the coin, to begin to multilateralize this mm -hmm. and do it mm -hmm. quickly is the fact that Fujian province has more missiles than any other place on the face mm -hmm. of the earth, and they're all aimed at Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And it would mm -hmm. take almost nothing for China mm -hmm. to suddenly yeah. make a decision that, oh, I think we'll nuclearize a few of those mm -hmm. and really put a new dynamic mm -hmm. in the defense of Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wanted to follow up on your mention of Daniel Ellsberg's book. Mm -hmm. um, if there's anybody in this room who hasn't read it, mm -hmm. you need to read it. Scary. Oh, I've been at... I, I, as, as some of you know, I joined the nuclear disarmament movement just two years ago, so I'm still learning a lot. I learned a lot from Daniel Ellsberg's book, and there were two things that stuck out for me. You talked about the systems, but in fact, what we've got, and I approach this from an engineering point of view, and I did a lot with systems engineering, thinking about things as complex mechanisms and what can go wrong and stuff like that. What Ellsberg reveals is that we've got a system in the world, especially between the Soviets and the United States, that has a finite possibility of going off accidentally, mm -hmm. leading to nuclear weapons. Okay. Real nuclear weapons, the one that wipes out civilization. It's a finite probability, finite possibility, small, but it's finite, going off accidentally or being set off by a terrorist or some willful bad person in the, in the mechanism. <laughs> it's a human mechanism, it's got a lot of mechanics and a lot of electronics, and a big system like that has a lot of failure points. So we're living with the finite possibility that, that human uh, life on Earth could be wiped out. Think about it. And when the you world appreciated that, I think they wouldn't want to live that way. Mm -hmm. And it's a man-made system, it can be taken apart by men, Second thing is that Ellsberg reveals that I didn't realize, and this sort of goes along with what you were saying, Leonard. <clears throat> the thinking in the military is so totally different from the way we think. The military, there are, there are significant parts of the military, particularly those connected with the uh, nuclear weapons system, who think it's fine to obliterate a lot of people. Mm -hmm because we're going to make a point or we're going to deter them. And, and it's run away. What I saw in Ellsberg's book is that that thinking has run away with the civilian, from, with the civilian uh, side of the military. Just if I could put it as an organizer, By the, way, the number of people in this room are part of the nuclear weapons working group of, of MAPA, but some aren't. So I'm circulating a, a sign-up sheet just so we can get all the names for the MAPA working group. Thank you. Well, I should have done so. And, so. and also just say Ellsberg is the keynote speaker at the conference in New York. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I, you, want, you had a comment to make that I think everybody should hear. About, uh, oh, I was just... About uh, um, which one was it? <laughs> 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 Daniel, I had lunch with Daniel. It extended about two hours a few months ago. And, he scared me to death. I mean, and he's an expert. I mean, he was there. He did it. What we don't realize is he was a nuclear war planner for yep. 10 years at the highest level of the government. He had a security clearance that you couldn't even talk about. If you mentioned that you lost your security clearance. Actually, actually, at age 30, he wrote the nuclear war fighting doctrine. Yep. At age 30. Right. <laughs> Very hard time. So what did he scare you with? Well, this new appreciation, which he had all kinds of scientific, he pushed paper after paper at me, scientific evidence to support, much like the scientific evidence that now supports the climate crisis um, on nuclear winter and, and what it's going to do, even with a moderate exchange, let alone a massive exchange. I, I should add one thing, to, if you're talking about books to read, the other one is called Command and Control, which is about the near accidents that have happened over the years. Good Bill Perry to tell you about his. Oh. He, he is sec-deaf, 
He's in his, in his bedroom, 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. in the morning, mm -hmm. and he gets a telephone call from the watch officer in the National Military <laughs> Crisis Center, Command Center in the Pentagon. And the guy says, there's been a launch. And he says, obviously, what? <laughs> what kind of launch? And the guy says, the Soviets have launched a spread of ICBMs of us. Are you sure? Go back and check the data. Meanwhile, he's getting the red phone and getting ready to get on the line with the president. Minute goes by, not too good for a minute to go by with no reaction. And he gets a call back on his other phone. He picks it up. It's a watch officer saying, Mr. Secretary, I apologize. Someone left the exercise scenario from last week's game in the computer, and I inadvertently played it. And Bill said, Imagine my relief when I didn't pick up the red phone. This is a Secretary of Defense telling us. Night Watch. Did you watch that show? I've, I've heard of it. Madam Secretary, yeah. everybody yeah. should watch that. Yeah. We're showing it all over yeah. in, in the Boston area. It, it, it's coming up in a few weeks. I think we're going to have it here. Cambridge Library. You, you, I think you brought it. I think it's your, your colleague yeah. who's coming. Um, by the way, there's also a conference in New Jersey, if you know people in New Jersey, at the Institute of Technology, where Elsa Ross will be speaking. I'll be speaking. ZMEN will be speaking. Um, at Bruce Blair. I'm not, I think Bruce Blair will be speaking. Um, but anyway, if you know people in New Jersey, uh, they're eager for an audience.